Um, one of the main purposes of today's um, of the joint meeting is to um, get basically comments or um, uh, verbal comments and, and potential study requests from, from stakeholders. Um, before we get into that portion of the meeting, um, we put together a short presentation for you folks. Um, we kind of want to go over the project layout and the operation again. Um, I know um, you know we didn't see the facilities this morning, but we'll summarize that again and go over that again in case there's any questions. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the FERC relicensing process and the schedule as it pertains to the Rollinsford hydroelectric project. We'll talk about some key dates. Um, we'll give a very brief overview of uh, the pad and the information provided in that, um, just to get people acclimated to it and what purpose it serves. And then finally, we'll um, leave the floor open for any, for any comments or um, information requests that um, folks may want to um, verbalize here today. Um, there is a 60-day comment period after today's meeting where folks can um, put more formal comments together in writing. So, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. Um, the meeting is being recorded. Um, we're required by FERC to, to record the meeting and provide a transcript to them um, as part of the record. With that, um, we'll get into the presentation. If you have any questions at any point, just feel free to, feel to jump in. Let's sort of keep this informal and uh, sort of relax. So if you have questions, jump in. Um, first, a little overview of the project. Um, here we are here, Rollinsford Dam. Um, owned by the town of Rollinsford, um, Consolidated Hydro New Hampshire, um, operates um, and maintains the project um, for the town. Um, we'll talk about that arrangement a little bit more. Um, and Consolidated New Hampshire is a subsidiary, subsidiary of EMAL. Um, immediately upstream is the Lower Great Falls project, um, owned by the city of Summersworth. And Summersworth Hydro, Summersworth Hydro is a subsidiary of um, Anel, so they're co-owners of that project. Um, their license expires uh, April 30th, 2022. Um, and I should say, um, Rollinsford license expires August 31st, 2021. Um, just upstream of the Lower Great Falls project is a Summersworth um, hydroelectric project owned by Clara. It also has an August 31st, 2021 um, expiration date. I know some of you had a, a joint meeting and site visit up there a few weeks ago um, as well to discuss the issues and, and the project up there as well. Um, and immediately downstream is the, the South Berwick project um, owned by Sand Falls Hydro, I believe another subsidiary of Enel. Um, it's been relicensed more recently, um, so its expiration date is um, way out in November of 2037. Um, I think some folks actually ran down there um, after our site visit this morning to, to check that out, to check out the video fish ladder down there. Um, so that's kind of an overview of the, of the lower Salmon's Falls, Falls Base and Lower Watershed. Um, Kevin alluded to, the, to this this morning, um, and maybe we can just summarize it one more time. The licensee, the, the former network license for the Rollinsford Hydroelectric Project is the town of Rollinsford. Um, there's a lease agreement um, between the town of, town of Rollinsford and Consolidated Hydro, um, New Hampshire, um, in which they um, operate and manage the project for the town. Um, and throughout this process, um, Consolidated Hydro, um, subsidiary of now, um, will be managing the relicensing effort, um, basically running it and managing it. Um, just kind of point that out because it's maybe a little bit different than um, some of the other hydro arrangements where there's you know one owner and one um, operator. Um, it really shouldn't make any difference um, here. It's just going to be, be behind the scenes as the town of Rollinsford and um, Consolidated Hydro is, are going to have to do some some coordination and, and kind of work together. Um, but you know you shouldn't see any of that, and it should, should just sort of be a seamless process. But uh, we just want to point it out so so that everyone sort of understands. <coughs> So, uh, agency's contact point is Consolidated Hydro New Hampshire, or the town, or both? Uh, consolidated Hydro New Hampshire. So, the, to to myself, I think that's all spelled out in the in the PAD and NOI, and so the, the, all the contact information there. Okay. Okay. Um, if, if I if I uh, could uh, also emphasize. Uh, just for the purposes of the recording, if, whenever you speak, if you could please identify yourself, uh, that help uh, 
transfer or anything like that. So that's it. This is Kevin Webb, Hydro Licensing Manager, and of Green Power North America Inc. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, maybe we can take a few minutes again to sort of summarize the project features um, shown here on this overhead. Um, the major features include the project dam, um, the intake structure that we saw this morning with the trash racks on it. Um, from the intake structure, water is conveyed uh, through it down through um, <coughs> underground, partially underground uh, penstock um, into the project four bay or, or water box. Um, and then from there, the water is uh, pushed through the two units in the powerhouse. Um, those are sort of the main, main components of the project. Um, and we also have this bypass reach of the river um, as well. Um, so we'll go on and talk a little bit more about those <coughs> um, kind of nuts and bolts, um, numbers and so forth. All of this is in the pad, too, if you need to refer back to it. But um, maybe we can kind of go through the nuts and bolts of it. Um, Project Dam, uh, 385 feet long, 19 feet high. It's a concrete and masonry structure. Um, of that 385 feet, 285 feet <coughs> consists of a spillway. Um, on top of the spillway, we do have 15-inch high wooden flashboards, um, which are used to maintain the, the pond at 71.25 feet. Um, the intake structure, which we saw this morning, um, is covered with these steel trash racks. Um, there's a two and a half inch bar spacing um, for the trash racks. And um, under full load or full capacity of the project, um, the calculated approach velocity of the water um, as it's entering the trash racks is um, 1.3 feet per second. Um, so we just kind of point those out because those are kind of important parameters when we start talking about um, potentially fish and train and pension and um, that sort of thing. <coughs> um, the penstock in the four bay, um, this is a, a picture of the four bay that we saw this morning, or four bay or water box, I kind of use those terms interchange, inter interchangeably. Um, the penstock is, um, most of it is, well it, it's concrete, it's 10 feet by 10 feet, 10 feet wide and 10 feet high, and it's um, most of it, almost um, all of it is lined by um, uh, a steel pipe, if you will, that's sort of lined through it. Um, I think that was some, some modifications that were made during the original construction, possibly to, um, to shore it up to make sure that um, it would leak. Um, and it's approximately 600 feet long, again, traveling from the intake structure down to the four bay. Um, four bay is uh, 40 feet wide by 30 feet long, um, constructed of concrete. Um, and the crest elevation is um, 70 feet, just below, slightly below the, uh, the normal pond elevation. Um, through the four bay, water is passed into the powerhouse um, and is put into um, two units, two Francis units. Uh, each one has a rated output of 1,040 horsepower and coupled to those turbines are um, two uh, generators with a maximum capacity of 750 kilowatts. Um, so the both of them combined um, give the plant a maximum capacity of 1.5 megawatts. Um, and, and that's the maximum capacity, of course, at certain times of the year when um, there's not enough water available to, to run at maximum capacity. But that's the maximum output when water is available. <coughs> Um, the combined hydraulic capacity of the two units is 450 CFS, 456 CFS, and the minimum hydraulic capacity of, of one turbine, basically the low threshold for it to be able to run and turn on, is um, 80 CFS. And the net operating head at the plant is 45 feet, so that's basically the elevation difference between the head pond and the tailwater, um, minus any head losses that occur through uh, the pen stock and the four main turbines. Um, and then we have the 680 foot long bypass reach um, that we saw this morning, yeah, extending from the dam down to the tail race. Questions so far? Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about the project boundary. Um, we see that outline here, um, beginning down, roughly down around the, the end of the tail race and extending upstream um, approximately a mile uh, of shoreline on each side is, is encompassed by that polygon. 
Um, the project boundary, um, using FERC's definition, um, are, lands, are, are lands that are needed to operate and maintain the project. Um, so basically the, the licensee, in this case the town of Rollinsburg, um, um, basically must have either, either own or have rights or easement rights um, to those lands um, contained within the project boundary. Um, the area within this project boundary is 58.7 acres. That includes land and water. Um, 46.5 acres is water, uh, most of that being the common, and 12.2 acres is uh, upland area, um, you know, these shorelines and, and the land down around the powerhouse as well. Of the 12.2 acres, the town of Rollinsford owns um, 4.9 acres approximately of the upland area with the, the remaining 7.3 acres in private ownership. So talking about project operation, um, the facilities operate as a run river facility, which basically means um, you know, any water that's coming down to the river is either passed through the powerhouse or passed into the bypass reach um, sort of instantaneously. There's no store and, store and release operation or peaking operation where um, you know, water is held back to the dam um, and the, uh, the impoundment is, um, rises and um, all of a sudden the turbines are turned on and, and water is re released. There's no pulsing of flows. It's basically an instantaneous flow. Um, whatever's coming down the river is either passed instantaneously through the powerhouse or the bypass, as I said. Um, the project's also operated um, automated or has automatic control, which basically means that um, if there's a sensor that um, in the head pond and it's, it's set to maintain that head pond elevation at 71.25 feet. And depending on river flows, if river flows change, the, the turbines are basically throttled up or down um, to maintain that constant head pod elevation. Um, there's a minimum flow requirement for the bypass reach under the current FERC license of 10 CFS or inflow, which is ever less. Um, that is provided um, mainly through a notch in the flashboards. Um, so maybe you may have saw that this morning, there's a small notch in the flashboards where water's allowed to flow through. Um, and, and also any leakage um, that occurs at the dam is sort of in addition to the 10 CFS. Um, 10 CFS is size, um, or the notch in the flashboards is size to pass 10 CFS. And any leakages that it goes into the minimum, that goes into the bypass um, sort of supplements that 10 CFS. Um, in the FERC license, there is a minimum flow requirement for the river reach below the project. Um, that's 115 CFS or inflow, um, whichever is less. Um, and again, we touched on this before, the, the maximum generation capacity of the project is 1.5 megawatts. And over the, last, over the last 15 years or so, the um, average annual generation of the project um, has been approximately 5.9 million kilowatt hours. So again, that's just kind of a summary of the project uh, layout and, and so forth. So, any questions so far? Um, let's talk a little bit about the FERC licensing process. I know a lot of you are familiar with it, um, having done this before, maybe others not so much. Um, but FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, um, has exclusive authority to, to license non-federal hydropower projects. Um, they also monitor license compliance, um, which is basically when a project has a license, there's certain terms and conditions in the license that they must adhere to. So um, FERC's also in charge of making sure those um, conditions aren't violated, um, you know, minimum flows are maintained, headwater um, pond elevations are maintained, and so forth. Um, and um, there's also another, another branch of FERC that um, is concerned with dam safety, um, making sure the dams are, sit, are safe, there's periodic inspections, and other things that go on, um, making sure they're safe to uh, prevent any loss of life or, or um, damage to property. FERC licenses last for uh, you know, 30 to 50 years, um, depending on the project. Um, and each one contains um, terms and conditions on how the project must be operated. Um, minimum flows, headwater, um, pond elevations, and and also any terms and conditions related to environmental resources or recreational resources as well um, are contained in that license. Uh, 
um, a little bit more about the FERC licensing process. Um, Town of Rollinsford has elected to use uh, FERC's traditional licensing process. Um, there are three processes, processes available. Um, the tra traditional license, licensing process, or TLP, the ILP, um, the integrated licensing process, and the alternative licensing process. Um, so, um, oftentimes called the ALP. So, um, with this type of project, it's a smaller project um, with um, kind of a, a really focused set of resource issues. Um, it, that type of project oftentimes makes itself better to the traditional licensing process. So that was kind of one of the reasons um, why it was chosen. Um, and it has the advantage, say, over the, um, the ILP um, in that with the ILP, there are a lot of um, deadlines um, where agencies and the, the licensees um, have to file um, make different filings and so forth, and um, sometimes that can be kind of taxing um, on both sides resources and so forth in terms of meeting those deadlines. And the TLP is a, um, I guess, a little bit more relaxed um, form of process. So, um, because of all those reasons, it was felt that that was a better process um, for us to use here. There are three stages of the TLP. Um, currently, we are in stage one. Um, a notice of intent in EAD, pre-application document were filed August 31st, 2016. Um, we're holding this joint meeting here today, and um, following today there's a 60-day period for study requests. Um, that's stage one. Stage two um, generally is um, where the town of Rollins or the applicant will um, take the study requests, examine them, um, and begin um, developing study plans um, that um, I think we'll eventually we'll share with the agencies, um, which will outline uh, the goals of goals and objectives of each study, um, the methodologies to be used, and so forth. Um, and then after that, the actual studies will take place and um, they'll be executed. And those study results will be along will be prepared and incorporated into a draft license application. And all of those steps that I just outlined there are stage two of the TLP. Um, after the draft license application is issued, there's a 90 day comment period for stakeholders um, to comment on it. Um, and then after that, the Town of Rollinsford will uh, address those comments and put together a final license application and file that with FERC. And at the conclusion of that, the filing of the final license application, that, that's the end of stage three of the TLP. If, if I could just do a quick interjection, Ben's just getting web and green power. Uh, wh whenever Kirk mentions the town of Rollinsburg will do thus and so, or has already done you know, some action, that will actually be us as Enel Green Power North America or, or as Consolidated Hydro. I just want to put, some, put, put, put you at risk, Suzanne. <laughs> you are not responsible for doing this. We are responsible for doing it. But we'll, we will be executing all these actions or have already executed these actions on behalf of the town. Thank you. So once the final li license application is, is in, it's more or less in FERC's hands. Um, what FERC will do is conduct an environmental analysis, um, whether they're not um, the National Environmental Policy Act regulations, the NEPA regulations. And for this project, they'll, um, they'll do that and they'll issue an environmental assessment. And shortly after that's issued, um, they will issue a new license order um, for the project um, for a term of 30 to 50 years depending on how they see fit. Um, and that new license will contain the, the terms and conditions for operation of the project and also management of any environmental resources or recreational resources associated with it. So a little bit more about process. Um, the town of Rollinsford slash consolidated New Hampshire um, as part of the FERC licensing process, they're required to consult with federal, state, um, local agencies, um, non-government organizations, um, and any interested members of the public that, that want to come forward and participate in the process, um, which is basically what this is here today. Um, stakeholders can participate in a number of different ways. Um, they can recommend studies that they think are necessary um, to uh, examine project impacts and um, examine environmental potential environmental impacts. Um, they can review and comment on the draft license application. Um, 
draft in final license applications, and they can comment on those. Um, and they can also provide recommendations um, to FERC um, as FERC is examining or, or considering the final license application. Um, stakeholders can provide those recommendation, recommendations for terms and conditions to FERC, um, which FERC will then consider um, for the final license. Um, Town of Rollinsford um, Consolidated um, Hydro of New Hampshire is also responsible for providing information to, to stakeholders. Um, the first step in that process was providing the pre application document. Um, they're also responsible for conducting the studies um, and to address you know, issues and concerns that have been raised um, about the resources um, affected by the project. Um, they're also responsible for, for summarizing those study results in the final last license application and submitting those to FERC. Um, and as we talked about earlier, FERC will um, conduct their own independent analysis of the studies, the license application, um, all the information that has been submitted to it, along with the um, uh, comments from stakeholders and recommendations from stakeholders. They'll take all of that information, um, examine it, and do their own independent analysis um, come up with the, the license um, terms and conditions um, for the new project. I'm sorry, for the new license. Um, next, I just want to take a few minutes to talk about the, the FERC licensing schedule. Um, and this is it as we sit here today. Um, and maybe just go over a few key dates for everyone. Um, as you mentioned before, the NOI and PAD and the request to use the TLP were um, submitted to FERC on August 31st. Um, there are a few procedural steps after that, but um, on October 11th, um, FERC issued the NOC or the Notice of Commencement, which is basically kicks off this process, the official kicking off of this process where they approve the TLP. Um, again, a, a procedural step here to invite folks at this joint meeting. Um, then on November 30th, today, we're having a joint meeting and a site visit for folks. And um, the next important date is this um, deadline for comments and site requests from stakeholders, uh, January 29th, 2017, basically 60 days from today. Um, a deadline for, for folks to, to submit those things. Um, the next step after that is um, the applicant um, is going to consider those study requests um, and then develop study plans, um, which again will outline goals and objectives, describe the methodologies to be used, um, and so forth. Um, then next year, during the summer field season of 2017, is when we plan on um, conducting those studies. Um, and study reports will be drafted and, and put together. Um, shortly after the, uh, the field season is completed and the data is analyzed and um, reports worked up. And those, we anticipate those will be circulated to stakeholders sometime um, in 2018, during that May-August time frame, uh, approximately. And then stakeholders will be given a chance to, to review the report results and comment them on them and so forth. Um, 2018, the summer of 2018 is also the second field season. Um, it's sort of a backup. Um, if needed, we, we hope to complete everything in 2017, but sometimes Mother Nature doesn't always cooperate. Um, sometimes flows can be too high or too low um, to present the, the appropriate conditions to, to do a study. Um, so if that happens, you know, we have 2018 as a backup to, to hopefully get the right conditions um, to do a particular study if needed. Yeah, just a quick question. Michael Cotter, main DEP. So for the, after the first year of study and, you know, the draft reports, Will it be preliminary data sent out before the summer of 2018, just in case you know one of the agencies requires another year of study? Um, just saying, I'm like, about that. You know, I'll yeah, yeah, I, I, that I, in. I, I think we should do that. Yeah. Right, just in case you know you don't reach the report till June, and someone says, "Well, we need more data on downstream water quality," and you know you're already a month into the summer. Yeah, right. yeah, that might be good to get some of that data ahead of time. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. And I mean, yeah. and um, one of the things with this process is that, you know, there's flexibility to kind of do things like that. There aren't hard and fast deadlines. There, there aren't a lot of hard and fast deadlines. There are some, but um, 
where we can kind of, kind of work with some stakeholders on that and, and figure out something that works. Um, the next big deadline uh, is January 2019 is when we anticipate um, submitting the draft license application and the, uh, the study reports um, that go along with that. Um, there's a 90 day comment period for stakeholders um, which would put us out to April 2019 um, for those comments to come in, the comment deadline. Um, and then the applicant is gonna, gonna sort of address those comments um, and resolve any outstanding issues and um, issue a final license application um, on or before August 31st, 2019. Um, that's when the final license application will go into FERC. And um, from there, more or less, the process is in FERC's hands. Um, again, they'll be reviewing the application and, and making their, their determination. And um, we expect sometime before August 31st, 2021, they'll issue a new license for the project. Um, just a few words about the pre-application document, which was issued. Um, its purpose is basically to appoint stakeholders um, with a project and what's the environmental resources, or at least the information related to the environmental resources in the project area. Um, there's a couple main components to it. Um, it's a process plan and schedule within it. Uh, pretty detailed description of the project location, the facilities, and the project operation. Um, and also a pretty detailed um, description of the, the environmental resources associated with the project. Um, you know, things like the water quality, water, um, water quantity, um, fisheries resources, recreational resources, um, land use, cultural, to name a few. Um, also preliminary issues and, and studies are, are included in the pad um, along with, there's also a section in there that discusses um, relevant resource management plans as well. Um, and again, the purpose of it is basically for, for stakeholders to be able to have um, really kind of a reference document or, or a Bible, if you will, um, of the project, owner's manual, or whatever moniker you want to put on it, um, where that information is all in one place and it basically allows them to um, identify any issues um, or study requests that may be needed to, um, to supplement the information related to the project for the license application. So um, that was most of the background that we have for you today. I mean, this next step um, is um, really kind of the study requests and comments um, portion. Um, as I mentioned a couple of times before, we're asking stakeholders to, um, I think if they would want to or feel a desire to, um, submit written comments and study requests um, on the project um, on or before January 29th, 2017. Um, also today, this is an open forum too, if you'd like to make verbal comments. Um, we're asking um, that any study requests try to follow this format here. This is the first study criteria. Um, FERC does have a document, a guidance document, um, at this URL, URL address um, that's pretty helpful for people not familiar with the criteria. Um, and it goes through and actually gives a couple study requests um, uh, study request, sample study requests, if you will, and explains these criteria in more detail. Um, we're, we're asking for this because it's, it's just a little helpful, um, a lot more helpful when study requests come in because um, it helps add a little more detail um, to them and add, 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 draw, draw out a little more detail from the, from the requesters. Um, for, for example, it's just a lot easier if someone says, um, as opposed to say, well, go do a water quality study. Um, that they add more detail that, to that if they identify goals and objectives for the study. You know, well, what is the purpose of the study? What are we trying to determine? Um, if it can um, also, for instance, talk about um, <coughs> methodologies, um, you know, the sampling period. Would you sample in the summer? How frequently would sampling occur? Um, what parameters would be sampled? Um, things like that. Um, again, just to try to draw out a little more detail um, so that we kind of understand the, the study requests a little bit better um, for folks. So. 
Um, so again, any, any verbal comments that folks want to make today? Um, written comments, um, again, January 29th, you can address them to Kevin Webb. Um, his information is here. It's also in the pad as well. Um, I don't know if you have a preference, Kevin. I, I'm guessing you might want to prefer electronic email communication if, if possible. Yeah, but uh, yeah, you know, certainly for formal comments, you can submit them that to me that way. Uh, you know, if you have a quick question for me, you want to give me a call, feel free to call me anytime. Uh, email uh, is better in terms of documenting a, uh, a conversation. So uh, either way, but yeah, email would be preferred for formal discussions. So any, any questions on the, the project, for licensing process, um, schedule? Sure, Kathy Howell with Maine DEP. Could you send out your um, your uh, presentation mm -hmm. on the email to the people who are here today? That would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Are you anticipating any significant changes to the terms and conditions of the license? And if so, how might they affect the profitability or efficiency of the plan? Um, I think there will be some changes. It's kind of difficult right now. Um, we'll probably know better when the study requests come in. Um, that'll give us an idea of sort of what stakeholders are looking for, what sort of impacts they've identified. Um, so I, I think after January, Questions and we can, if there are comments or folks have like some preliminary ideas on study requests, and, uh, feel, free, feel free to speak up. We do have some additions as well for some native inland spe species. We'll go up to talk, talk through that, figure yeah. out exactly which species. Uh, 
or a groundwater fish valley service just to reiterate that we'll agree with Mike's comment that you know, all the agencies will be you know we're working, looking at the, those issues. Um, also, that there's going to be a need to do some evaluation of the you know, bypass flow. Um, and the, you know, the, the current bypass flow is not predicated on you know, commonly used evaluation techniques. Uh, if I might point out, uh, this is Kevin Webb from you know, Green Power. Um, relative to the water quality certification, um, you know, we, we as uh, Consolidated Hydro, back in, in, in the day before we were uh, Animal Green Power, uh, we also own and operate the, uh, the South Berwick project at, at, at the head of uh, Tide here. Um, and uh, we licensed that. I, I was personally involved in the licensing of that facility. Uh, back in the 90s. Um, at that time, uh, both states issued water quality certifications. Um, FERC ruled in the license that they were on, only going to accept the certification from the main side of the river because that's where the powerhouse is and that's where the discharge is. Um, and I don't, I'm not trying to raise a, a controversial issue here, but um, I think that it's something maybe that uh, we want to have a discussion with FERC on to see if that is still their policy on that, and I can share I can share that license with you folks, uh, so that uh, you, can, you can see that that is in the record for the South Pearl project. Okay. Sure. Is Kathy Howe of DEP um, Kathy Howe Kathy Howe of DEP. Do you know who your FERC PM is? Yeah. Uh, I don't have the name off the top of my head, but I believe he's listed in the. Uh, most recent correspondence, so uh, I'll, 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 I'll open up my laptop and, and pull that up. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And, and, and I guess, uh, you know, if, if that is going to be FERC's, FERC's ruling still, or so, still their policy, then, um, you know, the, I, you know, I guess in this case, they would be looking to to the state of New Hampshire for the 401, but that doesn't mean that Maine DEP still couldn't have some input in that, but it'd have to go, go by way of, D, of uh, New Hampshire DES. That, and, and I'm just, I'm just kind of Sure, sure. I, right, I understand and I think that we need to iron those things out. Um, the state of Maine has gotten direction from our Attorney General's office that we would issue um, an individual um, uh, 401 certification. Okay. So that's going to, we're going to have to iron that out. Yeah, okay, sure. Yeah, I couldn't uh, Connor, maybe yeah. that came up for the summer's worth project. I, I believe DES or Owen from DES mentioned that you know, they talked to their AG's office and it was the same way that they for legal reasons, both want to issue, both okay. states would issue a water policy. If I don't know with the FERC ruling, yeah. how that works, right. you know, and, and, only yeah. submitting one to FERC, or... And, 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 and I guess, yeah. the, the, the my only concern is that we end up with, with 401 certifications that conflict in their conditions. And um, given that FERC must adopt all of those conditions in the license, um, we could end up with some, some conflicting provisions. So, I, you know, the, regardless of how this plays out, you know, we're, you, the two agencies are going to need to coordinate yeah, very closely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. And that's our plan. Yeah. Okay. Good. So I, I just wanted to point that out. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll share that uh, that ruling with the South Florida project with you and, and I'll track down the, uh, the project, the first project manager. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great comments from New Hampshire DES and uh, with the 401 water quality certification program in New Hampshire. And we're going through this right now on Connecticut River with Vermont. Both yeah. states are going to be issuing their own 401s. Uh, FERC hasn't said anything to us as far as, you know, they're going to honor just one state versus the other depending on where the powerhouse is located and so forth. Yeah. So, 
you know, it'll be good to know who your contact is so we can double check with them. That yeah. Would be, that would be news to us if they're going to okay. just honor one state and not the others. Yeah. So. And again, that was that's in, in, in the license for yeah. South Pearl Project. Yeah. And we so. would, you know, it's like we're going to be doing, like what we're doing in Vermont, you know, we plan to coordinate closely with Maine and yeah. so forth. So. Okay. Very good. Amy Lynn, New Hampshire Natural Heritage Bureau. We're um, planning on requesting a rare plant survey for um, Biden's Hyperborea, which is a rare aquatic plant that was historically known to occur in tidal reaches of the um, Salmon Falls River, but hasn't been uh, surveyed for a long time. So we'll be submitting that, um, obviously, through the written process, but just wanted to see that.